Well, if you have your Bible, you have your Bible app and all that fun stuff. If you have the church app, then you know that you can uh, open that up and click on sermons, notes, and you'll be able to follow along. We do have some notes there, uh, editable, save them, do all that fun stuff if you like to do that. I'd like to pray with you, and then we're going to jump in uh, to Genesis, and we're going to go to 39, I believe. Yeah, we're going to go to 39, 40, and maybe 41. I just skipped 38 because it didn't really focus on Joseph. And uh, I just thought, I said I was going to teach on Joseph as we're kind of walking through this. So I'm going to jump right in at 39 and see if I can get through 41. We'll see. Would you join with me and pray? Lord, we love you and we give you praise. We're so thankful for what we feel today. Uh, I pray right now that everybody would feel your presence in such a strong way. There are many here, Lord, that uh, are encouraged. Some perhaps are looking, doubting. Some are wrestling with and grappling with so many things. I pray that your spirit would give them peace. I pray that you would allow the peace of God, that we would allow the peace of God to rule and govern our hearts. Open our understanding today. Anoint me with fresh oil that I might teach your word with revelation and with authority. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Praise God. I trust now that you have those Bibles and you're ready and you're locked in. And what I decided to do this time to do things a little differently is I am going to um, have my scriptures here on the screen. So that way I'm not looking and all that stuff. So let me uh, just do that and uh, get things ready. here. Let's look at Genesis 39. And I'm going to be reading, uh, I think I'm going to read right now through verse uh, seven or so. I hope that each of you all have had a great week. Uh, I can't tell you how terribly I miss you all. Uh, we've had a chance to see some of you. And this is one of the benefits of coming out to the prayer journey, or maybe we just showed up at your house in your driveway honking like we want to see you. <laughs> uh, but I cannot wait to get back where we are just in the house of the Lord, lifting up uh, his name, doing it together. But in the same time, we will live in the present and drink deep from what God is doing in our lives uh, together. Praise God. Look at this, Joseph, jo uh, Genesis 39. Now Joseph, this is verse one, obviously. We're just walking through the counsel of the word of God. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian bought him, uh, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord is with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord is with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and that all he had put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was all was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and that he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. We're going to stop there for just a moment. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I hope you guys can see me and you, we're, we're good to go. I, I trust that that's the case. Uh, but let me just kind of walk you through a few things really quickly. Now, something about the Egyptians. I want you to know the Egyptians are a remarkably sophisticated culture, advanced in a variety of ways, uh, very accomplished, uh, remarkable engineers. They were also a very religious people, uh, a very spiritual people. Uh, they were known to have a god for everything, a god or a goddess. They had one for almost everything in the present life and then also for things in the afterlife. Uh, the Egyptians are known uh, for their engineering and their building. To this day, in some cases, uh, historians and scientists have discovered stones uh, that weighed in excess, hear me, in excess of 15 tons, okay? This is remarkable stuff uh, that the Egyptians had pulled off. They were probably at this particular point in time, uh, the dominant culture, uh, the most influential and advanced society uh, to the known, to the then known world. If you name it, Egypt had a hand in it, militarily speaking, politically speaking, and certainly economically. 
and Joseph finds himself thrusted into this world. This was not what he uh, was, I shouldn't say, uh, this is not what he had in his mind. This is not what he envisioned. Remember, we read about a young man who was a dreamer and was perhaps a bit naive and maybe arrogant uh, to share his dreams with his siblings. However, this is not what Joseph had in mind, but we see a couple of interesting things here that I want you to understand. First of all, now Joseph, read this in verse one. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Here's another instance where we read about Egypt and the people of God going down into Egypt. Remember when Abraham was called to get up from out of his country in Genesis 12, he does that, but the famine hits. And when the famine hits, the Bible says that Abraham went down into Egypt. Egypt is a type of the world. Whenever we read about Egypt, we always hear about somebody when they're visiting, they're going down. Can I tell you, when you and I are going to the world, if you are leaving, you are going down. You are not headed in the right direction. Now, I will say this. This is interesting. Joseph's brothers thought he was a problem. They considered him and his dreams to be trouble. But we're about to find out that those dreams would be a massive blessing to Israel, uh, to Egypt. As a matter of fact, they just thought Joseph was an annoyance and a nuisance, and they called him a troublemaker. But he was a blessing to Egypt. Praise God. And this goes back to the covenant that God gave Abraham. Remember, he said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. And you, I am blessing you to be a blessing. If we understand, I believe this is the first impetus, scriptural impetus of the Great Commission. We have been called to be a blessing to others. May we not forget that. I want you, you know, I, I was asking myself today, sometimes I just, you know, if I'm just being real, my wife and my kids live with me. So uh, they're probably like, oh my gosh, this man is absolutely crazy right now. Uh, but you know what? Not that I have high highs and low lows, but I have moments where I'm just like, okay, I, I just, I need some space. But what we have to ask ourselves is, hey, look, am I being a blessing at all times? I want to be somebody that is a blessing. I want people to be excited to be around me, to be encouraged to be around me. And this is how the house of Potiphar and Potiphar specifically felt about Joseph. Now, of course, we know that God promised Abraham that his descendants would bring blessing to other nations. And Joseph is fulfilling this promise. Uh, now, Joseph is a good example, okay? And let, let's just talk about this for a moment, of being or making the best, if you will, out of difficult circumstances. Boy, that'll preach right there, won't it? <laughs> right now, we're trying to make the best out of difficult circumstances. COVID-19. I'll give you an example as I'm preaching. I have prepared or teaching, I should say. I'm preparing and studying and, and working on things and trying to learn new aspects of Zoom and things didn't go like I thought they would. At the end of the day, I can only control what I can control. I'm not going to get bent out of shape and lose sleep over that. I'm going to make the best out of the circumstances. Can I tell you? Uh, you know, I could have been like, rrr, 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 just mumbling under my breath and like, what's going on? Nothing ever works. I, this can't work. And why isn't this working? And just kind of lose it and be like, ah, no, 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 it's okay. Can I tell you, we all need to learn to make the best of circumstances, even when those circumstances are unpleasant. And I hope and pray, man, I hope that, you know what? I hope we're worshiping, we're praying, we're getting connected at home. But boy, when we get back together, let's make the best of it. Let's worship God with everything that we have. Let's lift up a loud voice to him together. But you know what? In these circumstances, like, let's make the best of it. Let's connect with one another. Let's love. Let's serve. Let's have fun. Make the best of these circumstances. I know it might be tough and difficult. We all are feeling it to a certain degree, but this is what Joseph did. And this is so important, okay? I love this. I love this because the Bible says in verse 5, check this out. And I hate that I'm not looking at the camera, but I'm just looking at the scripture here. Uh, it says, so it was from the time that he made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Now, did you catch that? <laughs> not because of Potiphar, but he did it for Joseph's sake. You need to realize, I believe this wholeheartedly. I believe this. This is Abrahamic covenantal type stuff. 
some reasons, some reasons why I was talking with somebody uh, just recently and they were like, oh, pastor pray uh, because, you know, uh, sister locations or different uh, venues uh, within their organization uh, came down, uh, had some COVID cases, uh, but uh, they were like nothing here. And I said, praise God. You know what? That the Lord is with you. The hand of the Lord is upon your campus where you're working. The hand of the Lord is upon where you're working. The hand of the Lord is upon you and your home and your family. And so we see this kind of favor, this divine favor that's on Joseph's life. And Potiphar is being blessed because of Joseph. And Potiphar knew that. This is why Potiphar was like, look, bro, you, I'm going to promote you so quick because I can't lose you. I'm going, what, what I have to do? I'm so confident in your leadership. I'm so trusting in your, and confident in your character and in your integrity. I'm so convinced that you've got the goods and I see it. I can't dispute it. So here's what I'm going to do, Joseph. I'm going to lay back and just let it ride. <laughs> I'm going to put it in your hands and watch God bless it. Praise God. When we do things unto the Lord, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit, I think you can already tell that I probably won't get to chapter uh, 41. We're going to see here. Uh, but I want you to know when you have to be faithful, I want you to hear this. I want you to catch this process. And I want you to be asking yourself, this is more than hopefully just a good Bible study. I want you to just kind of say, God, how does this apply to me? Let me look at the word. Let me study this a little bit. How can I be faithful over what God has entrusted to me? Can somebody say amen? Now, uh, and in that, we'll see this. How is my life? Uh, look at Joseph and how he grew. How can I grow so that people can entrust more to me? Even if you are a teenager, you know what you can do? You can, let, let me just make this plain. You can do your chores consistently. Now, now, look, you you're not getting up and running to school. You're not getting on the bus or getting in the car. Uh, you might not have all the extracurricular activities. This is a wonderful time to develop some good habits that will carry you on in life. And so do those things and watch the favor and the blessing of God be upon it and watch your parents begin to entrust more to you. So everybody can benefit from this and grow. And these are the things that I want you to Think about this. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 22, 29, it says, do you see a man who excels in his work? Check this out. He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. Are you hearing me? This is what happens when you excel at your work. This is why I'm trying to help somebody. Whenever you do it, whether it's five people, 50 people, under mom, dad, or nobody's watching. How about that? And it's got to do with self-leadership. Can I tell you, do it unto the Lord. And when you excel and you begin to really hone in on your craft or what it is you're doing and learn everything that you can to put your best foot forward, that is going to bring you into the presence of great men and women. People will recognize that. But others who don't do that, who are slack or apathetic or lackadaisical in their approach, they won't excel. As a matter of fact, Proverbs tells you exactly their end. And their end is complete and utter ruin. But this was not the case for Joseph. Joseph was faithful. Joseph was diligent. Joseph made the best of his circumstances. It's cliche, but it's true. What do you do with the lemon? Make some delicious lemonade. And by the way, I could use some lemonade. Praise God. Let me, I won't have any lemonade, but let me sip on some water. Praise God. Okay. So his faithful service wasn't only a blessing to the household. It was a blessing to Joseph himself, okay? Now, Joseph is growing. Sometimes you gotta just get kicked out of the nest. You know, he, he wasn't at home anymore. Things had gotten tough. Dad was pampering him and doting over him, and he was certainly the anointed one. He was the chosen heir. Uh, and so while his brothers might've given him a hard time, it was nothing like this. My man is sold into slavery, and now he's navigating through all of that, and he finds himself in a position, and he decides, to make the best of it. Can I just tell you, uh, you know, he, things have really changed for Joseph. But for us, let me just give you some practical application. For us, God's method for building us is to give us a job to do and people to obey. You need to, ne you need to understand that all things, I need somebody to hear me right now. I'm a passionate uh, proponent of preparation. This is why 
I understand. See, worship to me, let me just, man, I feel this in the Holy Ghost. Let me just help you understand this for a moment and get worship. Worship is more than singing a song, okay? I've told you this before because sometimes as we're growing in our walk with God, I believe we'll get back to the heart of worship. See, when the music fades and all else is slipped, you know, everything else has slipped away, I'm simply coming to you as I am. Here is when worship uh, is, here's when it really becomes worship. We worship him in spirit and truth. In other words, I'm not just talking about doctrinally accurate. I'm talking about all of who we are. That's really what that means when it says truth. But when we first read about this, the word worship, and we hear about it, Abraham says, the lad and I are going up yonder to worship. Well, if you peel back what's happening in that context, Abraham is getting ready to sacrifice his son, his promise, Isaac. I mean, this is what God gave him, and he, he's obeying to do so. So worship will always be obedience and sacrifice. So for us, the totality of our existence is worship unto the Lord. It is not just a song. It's more than a song. God, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. You know, it's I give you my thought life. I give you my relationships. I trust you, and I give you my finances. God, I, I give you my resentment and my bitterness. I give you this task that I'm doing in cleaning the dishes or cleaning the house. I give you this in the way I study uh, physics or the way I study algebra or calculus. I give you this the way I uh, am learning my English composition. I give you this the way I'm learning mathematical statistics. Whatever it may be, I'm doing it unto the Lord and it's preparation. And so one of the things that God wants us to do in preparation is he typically gives us an assignment. And we always have people that we're accountable to. Can I tell you, you will, you need to hear me. Young people, young adults, grown folks, no matter where you are, you will not grow in your leadership if you are unwilling to be accountable to others. You need somebody in your life who can tell you about yourself and can tell you what to do. And here's the good thing about it. And here's the cool thing I should say. How do you respond when somebody gives you instruction? How do you respond when somebody tells you what to do? You know what? I was just on the phone with uh, my grandmother. She'll be 102, or 102 if she lives, if the Lord sees fit to allow her to do so. We celebrate what God is doing in her life. She is a gift and a treasure. And we were just FaceTiming yesterday, having the time of my life. We were just having a good time talking and connecting. And my dad was there and I wanted to pray with him. I typically, uh, one of the things that I kind of feel like God is doing in my life, every time I talk to somebody at this point, I'm like, let's pray before we get off the phone. <laughs> I want to pray for you. I want to bless you. <sighs> Praise God. <laughs> Getting choked up. I want to pray for you. Bless you. I want you to be encouraged. I said, big mama, that's what I call her. I said, big mama, I want to pray, pray with you. We prayed twice. I just felt so good. But the first time my dad had uh, called uh, his siblings and he said, come here, crazy sisters. And uh, Big Mama was like, uh, excuse me? And he was like, okay. I'm, and he called him by name. He said, Linda and Adrian, y'all come here. You need somebody. You have to be accountable to people. You need somebody that can tell you what to do. And how do you respond? My father's in his 70s. And it was not a problem at all. Was, yes, ma'am. Uh, Linda, Adrian, it's the same thing for me. I have people in my life that will tell me what to do. And guess what? I do it and I do it gladly. This is a part of our development. Okay, God is testing us, okay? Because here's the deal. People think leadership is about promotion and about people serving us. It's really the other way around. The, 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 uh, the more you develop in your leadership, the more you serve, the higher you go up, so to speak, the fewer rights you have. But you need to understand that before God promotes anybody to rulership, he needs to see how you serve. Before you can lead, you have to follow. And it's easy to follow when everything is great. Oh, boy. I mean, let's do it. Let's do it, Pastor. Let's do it, Mom. Let's do it, Dad. Let's do it, Boss. Oh, man, everything's great. Until somebody wants to do something that you're not thrilled about or you don't agree with. And then it's like, oh, mm -hmm. they don't know what they're doing. Or, you know what, I'll do it. But I'm not going to do it with a smile on my face. They're going to know. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, that young, uh, the mom would tell the boy, sit down and he didn't want to sit down. I might have the story confused a little bit. Uh, but anyway, he, he, was, he, he sat down. 
Um, but on the inside, he was standing up. <laughs> and that's what he said. He said, I might be sitting down, but on the inside, I am standing up. And you know, we can do the same if we're not careful. Can I tell you, enjoy this process. Show God he can trust you in this process. Show God can trust you with a test. Show God can trust you because the test is trying to prove you. The test is trying to prove you. Before he allows us to exercise authority, we have to learn whew, We have to learn how to be under authority and learn how to obey. This is the only way we'll be able, man, we'll be able to exercise his authority is if we learn how to submit to authority. Are you hearing me there? And Joseph is learning this and God is blessing it. And it is evident to a pagan people that God is with Joseph. They've seen what their gods can do. Now they're seeing what Jehovah can do. This is phenomenal stuff. So now let's check it out. Now, because a lot of people are checking Joseph out. Y'all know where I'm going. <laughs> a lot of people are checking Joseph out. See, the latter part of verse six, Joseph had to deal with what Mateo and Tito deal with. They were handsome in form and appearance. I mean, this is the stuff that Aiden and Lincoln and Marcus and Andrew, I wish I knew what this plight was like. I, that's this, I, don't, I don't have that dilemma. But Joseph had this dilemma. Not only was the Lord with him, ladies, he was handsome in form and in appearance. Just my boy Joseph had it going on. That workout, they, they must have had my man doing a regiment. He was just tight and he was right. And so because of that, some interesting things happened. Let's read about it. After it came to pass after these things, I'm in verse seven, that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. You belong to him. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do work, to do his work, and none of the men of the house was inside, sounds like a setup, that she caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them saying, see, see, he has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us. He came in to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. So she kept his garment with her until his, uh, his master came home. Then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came in to, came in to me to mock me. So it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him saying, your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined and he was there in the prison. Now, Joseph had already suffered a great deal because his brothers hated him and threw him in a pit. But now he's facing even a, a greater danger to a degree because while his brothers, some one of them did, Reuben we know, and Judah were like, hey, look, let's not, let's not do that. We know they sold him into slavery, but now he's facing a greater danger because he's facing a woman who has no morals, no scruples, and frankly, is an evil woman. Let me tell you what Proverbs, Proverbs, by the way, I want to encourage you. Uh, this is something that I aim to do every day. I don't do it every day. Sometimes I miss it. 
in my devotion, depending upon the scope of my devotion. But I try to read the Proverbs every day. And this is something else that Proverbs speaks to a great deal. But I want you to see what it says here about this type of woman. Proverbs 23, verse 27. It says, for a harlot is a deep pit and a seductress is a narrow well. So it's a different pit that Joseph was dealing with, but he was dealing with the pit nonetheless. And the reality of it is this pit is a whole lot deeper than what Joseph's brothers had thrown him into. Potiphar's wife is treating Joseph in a humiliating way. Now, in one sense, I know if you study this or you read a little bit about it, you're probably saying, wait a second, pastor. Uh, isn't he a slave like her property? I would agree with you, yeah. And she probably treated him like property. She probably viewed him as property. And so she probably became very angry when she's telling her property as she sees like, well, this is my husband's and whatever is my husband's is mine. So when I tell you to do something, i.e. if I tell you to give me a glass of water, you best go get me a glass of water. If I tell you to do this, then you best be ready to do that. And I think she probably did have that attitude and looked at it in that regard, but that still nonetheless justifies it. I think it just tells us perhaps how she viewed Joseph and why she was so insistent because she did not see him as a person. She saw him as a thing or an object, but that still did not make her right by any stretch of the imagination. As a matter of fact, she left nothing to the imagination because she was insistent. But I'm thankful for Joseph and integrity because he modeled this consistently. If you recall, this wasn't a one-time overture. This is a serious advancement. She's being very forward and is doing so on a daily basis. But it took a great deal of courage, perseverance, integrity, determination. I could go down the list on what Joseph displayed. But let me give you a few things as to why he explained why he wouldn't cooperate. I love this. First, she's another man's wife. <laughs> Praise God. And happened to be that the wife to his master. Two, he was trusted by his master and didn't want to violate that trust. Third, even if nobody else found out about it, hear me, God would know about it and would be displeased. Remember, he concluded, I, I, I love this because really what Joseph is trying to do. Now, everybody knew the favor of God was on him, including Potiphar, Potiphar's wife. So he says, listen, you're, you're this man's wife. Two, this is my master. Okay, three, he has entrusted everything to me except you because you're his wife. He's trying to rationalize with her and give her very credible and legit reasons as to why he should not commit this transgression. And then, most importantly and emphatically, he said, okay, if nobody knows, God knows, he would be displeased. I will not sin against God. And so Joseph does that. And so really, we understand her posture. She wanted a moment of pleasure, but Joseph refused and would not sin against God. I'm thankful for that. I'm also thankful for that counsel. Uh, you know what? I just wanna to talk to our men just for a brief moment because Paul did tell Timothy to flee youthful lust. I know we might be thinking, man, and we kind of laugh, Joseph just running. There are some times when it's okay to run because he said flee youthful lust. I know sometimes we might think of running as being a coward or cowardice, uh, but can I just tell you, and that might be the case in some instances, but there are some instances when it's okay to run. You know what, when you got to run, man, you put on those kicks, you get in there and you go, and you'll watch your character, your integrity, and more importantly, your purity will be preserved. Now, here's something else that's being re uh, revealed about Joseph. I want you to just set, let, let this settle in for just a moment. I'm not going to keep y'all. You all have been so kind. Thank you, because typically we try to break this up and Mateo gets on the call and you all don't have to listen to me the entire time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being so gracious uh, to endure this 
uh, we really are going to mix this up and hope to make this a bit more engaging. Uh, and I am not going to keep you all more than an hour. That's my commitment. So we will be stopping shortly. But I want you to understand what's revealed about Joseph in this process. Okay? Self-control. Self-control is an important factor in building character and preparing us for leadership. Now, we all know the end of the story. So we know where Joseph is headed. But I want you to look at how he is faithful and diligent over a few things before he can be promoted to ruler and God entrust him with more. You know, I, I can remember, let me, let me just say this. This is, may sound corny, but Pastor Buddy Thompson, my first pastor, we've got a great relationship, love and respect him. Uh, and he had a huge imprint, uh, made a huge imprint upon my life. I can remember just wanting to do stuff. And uh, he just, he sat down and was like, man, will you do this one? I was glad that whatever my pastor wanted me to do, do it. But I can remember, and you all have heard me tell this story before. Uh, but uh, if, uh, you know what, uh, I would pick people up in the church and it didn't make a difference. Uh, I'd pick people up. We had this old van, old uh, church van. We called it Old Whitey. Man, Old Whitey was, I was praying. That thing would keep you praying because I was just like, Lord, let it just get to where I needed to go <laughs> to pick people up. I would get up early pick them all up, bring them to the church. And I was glad to do that. I, it was my goal to try to pack the van out because certain people needed transportation. We'd have fun and uh, I just have a great time, man. Some of my best memories uh, just in ministry were, were that fun stuff. Uh, I remember picking up people. <laughs> I'm thinking about one guy. My wife will remember this guy named Willie. Man, <laughs> look, Willie, uh, it was special needs, but man, you know, they made me never pick him up. Willie didn't always bathe as well as he could. Uh, man, he had my car just, he just blessed me, just blessed my car. Y'all hearing me? Uh, and so one time I remember though, I was, we were ripping and running and I was running late. Uh, and we zipping down the road. And uh, Willie didn't always say a little much. Uh, we, we'd talk a little bit, but I got a ticket and he thought that was so, so funny. Uh, but anyway, talking about being late, I remember my pastor told me, he said, son, he said, you demonstrate so much potential such a good work ethic. He said, but you're late. And my parents would tell you, uh, prior to this, I was late all the time. <laughs> Even early on in our marriage, then this is when Buddy called me out, because he used to drive Sarah crazy. Sarah has trained me at, look, you know, we know who runs the house, and any married man knows that, okay? It's your wife, don't kid yourself. But she was like, look, uh, this, this late, this stuff is gonna stop. And so uh, it helped me, but I also remember Pastor Buddy saying, man, don't you value other people's time? Who do you think you are? How can you be so self-absorbed, so self, uh, so unaware of others that you think what you have going on in your world trumps what everybody else has going on? And he just spoke frank to me. He was like, who do you think you are? He said, we've been waiting here 10, 15 minutes. And it was just like, I needed that wake up call. It was an opportunity for me to develop self-control. I can remember another time when I used to drive, man, I used to be a speed angel. I don't want to say a demon. I just speed angel. I just always speed. <laughs> and I can remember uh, losing uh, my privileges because it is a privilege to drive. Uh, and I lost those privileges for a season. Uh, but I can remember one day I was just driving and speeding. And man, the Holy Ghost came in my car so strong and was like, why are you speeding? And I was like, Lord, I'm, 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 I'm just being honest. I'm running late. And he said, oh, okay. He said, so if you would have, you know, done what you needed to do to get up in a time and prepare in advance and leave in advance, you mean you wouldn't be speedy? And uh, he said, so you have a lack of self-control and preparation. Man, the way he was talking to me wasn't scolding me, but he was just kind of lovingly, like the only the Holy Ghost can do, lovingly revealing this to me. And I realized, he said, you don't have to speak. You're choosing to do so. But are you subjecting yourselves to the law of the land? Or do you think you are above it? And I thought to myself, God, you're right. I'm just repenting, broken. And I needed to realize I was choosing. So self-leadership or self-control, while it is difficult, it is an essential tool to preparation. And these things, these things add up. Don't speed. You show up on time. Next thing you know, as the spirit, remember, it's the fruit of the spirit that will help you with self temper or temperance, self-control. The next thing you know, you're governing what you say. You're governing what you think. 
You're governing what you listen to. You're governing what you watch. And you're finding yourself in alignment with the Holy Ghost. And there's nothing more fulfilling and rewarding and liberating than being in tune with God because we have learned to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow after him. Joseph is living this out. He's living this out. So let me tell you what else Proverbs says. I want you to see this, Proverbs 25, 28. You need to highlight this one in your Bible. This is like something that you want to memorize. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Do you know what that means? In other words, where there are no walls, anything can get in or come out. Joseph exercised self-control. Think about this for a moment, okay? But what did Samson do? Oh, poor Samson. I know Samson was vindicated at the end, but Samson also chose to gratify his own pleasures. You see the difference? Yeah, Samson was vindicated at the end, but he ended up buried in a pile of rubble. I need somebody to hear me. But Joseph ended up ruling a throne. My God, I can finish right there. You know what? Joseph ended up ruling a throne, but Samson was buried under rubble. Yes, he was vindicated. Yes, God heard him and gave him strength one more time. But Samson was like a city without walls and anything could get in and come out. But Joseph, whew, this is why you need to hear me. If you can have discipline, if you can have self-leadership, if we can learn self-control, then that thought that tries to come in and tell you, you have no value, you have no purpose, nobody's paying attention to you uh, while you take care of these fries or while you mopping this floor or while you're doing this behind the scenes, you can shut that voice out and say, I'm doing this to the glory of God. I'm doing this with the joy of the Lord in my heart. I'm doing this so God can be blessed and the people can be blessed and God will bless that. Praise God. So, you know what? What else is important here um, is this. We know, now keep in mind, Joseph uh, was signified by his garments. Whew, goodness. <laughs> I love this stuff. And I have to, I have to pick up the pace here um, in getting through this a little bit more efficiently. But I'm so enthralled by what's happening here. So remember, Joseph first receives a coat of many colors. And in some cases, depending upon the commentator and what we read and study, it could be a well-adorned coat and not necessarily just a coat of colors from a fabric perspective, could be both. But anyway, he had that. We know he lost that. He was marred with blood and returned to his fathers as if he was murdered by some wild beast. Now he's receiving a different coat and he loses that because he has to lose that because he's running for his life. And so it's interesting. He lost that coat, but he kept his character. Can I tell you, he could have kept a prominent position, so to speak, but Joseph realized his character was more valuable. This is where you and I have to value certain things. This is where we have to say, you know what, as opposed to position, I value character and integrity. This is why uh, I appreciate, and I remember my wife uh, very early on in our friendship, which uh, it was just a friendship. I think I said this last week, or uh, it was just, we just were good, really good friends. It was remarkable. Uh, and then I remember sharing some things with her, and then our friendship, the nature of it changed. And even for quite some time then, we hadn't expressed it. Uh, but in all of that, her character, integrity is impeccable. For, for, forget lying. For, for, forget it. Won't happen. I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, she's that kind of person. I, it's like right now, it's 827. If I ask her what time it is, it's 827. <laughs> not 830, not 825. You know, it's, and I can remember <laughs> early on in our marriage, you know, it's kind of like, oh, I'll be there in five minutes. And she was like, it's, it's eight and a half. You said five. You know, either you either you mean five or eight and a half. It's it's just as easy to say eight and a half. You know, so say what you mean and mean what you say. Uh, <laughs> and so it's like, hey, that was holding me accountable. You know what? Character, it, it, it let me know right out of the gate. Even though I knew that before we got married. She is a woman of principles, of character and integrity. Not gonna lie. 
regardless of what's at stake. And I'm thankful for that. Can I tell you, Joseph was willing to do the same. And those folks, may we all be willing to do that, where God hewns out our character. You might have opportunities and moments where somebody might think well of you because they perceive you a certain way or you're able to slide or manipulate a certain scenario, but God knows. And ultimately, who wants to play cover up? Be free from all of that and know that if God's hand is on your life, God is going to keep you. God is going to sustain you. God is going to raise you up because promotion doesn't come for the East or the West. It comes from the Lord. Now, uh, it's uh, here's what I want to do. We're going to talk about learning to wait. I'm going to circle this um, because this is going to be so good. I need to calm down because this will be on YouTube. <laughs> But I just get so excited. Next week, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about learning to wait. And this is the process of what Joseph is going through. 13 years are unfolding right before our eyes with the life of Joseph. And I can't wait to unpack them because those that wait upon the Lord, you know it, they that wait upon the Lord, shall mount up with wings as of eagles. Listen, I'm telling you, when we learn to wait, and so we're going to talk about that next week, but of course you have to wait until then. I love each and every one of you so much. You all are so valuable to the kingdom of God. I want you to know that the hand of God is upon each of you, and his plans for you are just as big as he is. I want to pray for you. I want to remind you, if you have time, join us in our prayer journey. We're going to be doing, uh, again, Friday at 730. And then if you're out and about shopping or you have some things in your pantry, put it together. Every bit makes a difference. Drop it off. We'll be there. It'll also be a good excuse for us to see you. We'll have gloves on. We'll take it out of your trunk. Nobody will touch anybody or we'll get it, but it'll be a great time. We're going to make an impact Saturday from 11 to 1, partnering with Growth and Gang. And uh, then we're going to be doing some really cool things in the immediate future with our programming. Uh, I cannot wait because Facebook Live this Monday, we're going to have a special guest, Evangelist Joe Zerpoli. You want to meet this guy. The hand of God is on his life. He's a recording artist. He is a dear, dear friend. And uh, it's remarkable to see what God is doing. I can't wait for you to hear his story. You're going to be challenged. And God is using him all over the globe. He's seen miracles, signs, and wonders. I can't wait for you to meet my good friend, uh, Evangelist Joseph Poli in our Facebook Live. We're also changing the time to 3 p.m. So be on the lookout. We're changing it from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. You'll be getting a lot of uh, social media posts about that, but we're looking forward to it. I want to pray with you. Lord, we're so grateful for your grace and your kindness and your mercy. I'm not sure where everybody is in their journey of development, but I do know this. We're here, and as long as there's purpose on our lives, we're in that refining fire. Whether that refining fire and how it manifests itself in our relationship with our spouse or in our relationship with our children or employer or just self or with you, Lord, I just pray that you would reveal to us, uh, and maybe even in a loving, gracious way, put the magnifying glass on some things that we need to work on. Lord, we want our character. You, you want us to know wisdom in this secret place. Help us, God, to be willing to be vulnerable and be broken and to say, man, I've, I've got this issue in my life or I've got this area that requires a little bit more discipline. And give us the wisdom to invite people to hold us accountable. Help us to uh, trust you in the process and to not get ahead of ourselves. I know we can easily see ourselves on the throne. That's easy, but nobody sees us or sees ourselves holding a broom and serving. God, help us to understand that you, you, the creator of the universe, made yourself of no reputation. When you took out, your out, took off your outer garments and knelt before your creation and washed their feet. What a marvelous example of servant-based leadership. If you can do that, if you, the king of glory, can come and robe yourself in flesh, divinity putting on this, this tent. <laughs> if you can do that, how much more with your spirit living in us can we serve others and enjoy this process and trust you and give you the glory? Lord, I know that we're preparing us for greater. 
you're preparing us for greater. There's a shift. Help them to see that, but help us to be faithful in this process so that we can be ruler over many for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. I'm so thankful for each of you. I hope that you enjoyed this. I enjoy connecting with each of you. I cannot wait to see everybody who comes out Friday night. We're going to have a great time. And then if you can't make it Friday or you can make it Friday, maybe you can make it Saturday. But hopefully we'll get a chance to see you in person. God bless you. Love each of you dearly. Have an extraordinary week in Jesus.